lunch, everyone. So this morning we saw our first five finalists um, here at X-Tech Search Five Finals. And now we're gonna go into our next five. So our first presenter of the afternoon is Project OWL. And the title of their demonstration is Project OWL Unidentified Network. Good luck. Project OWL has been an incredible journey. We were founded during a global technology competition sponsored by IBM. We have developed business and application in communities all over the world. While we were founded on the backdrop of natural disasters and providing basic communications to communities that have been hit by them, we see a bright future for our technology to expand just beyond community disaster resilience, but providing flexible, cost-effective communications to many places around the world that don't have it. These can be operational environments that come and go, but these may also be permanently established networks and communities that just don't have good infrastructure yet. Our goal when we were creating this technology is that we not only wanted to solve the problem, but also we wanted to make them that they're extremely easy to use. Not only is our technology much more cost effective, but also it's extremely adaptable to many different battle situations which allows us to be able to deploy in, all, in very unique situations, especially in areas where you have degraded communications, also where you have situations where you need to be quickly put in and brought out, or also put communications in locations where the typical soldier would not be able to reach. They're extremely simple to set up, which allows us to put these devices into the hands of any soldier. Good afternoon. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I'm Brian Knaus, co-founder and CEO of Project OWL. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you all today and continue to take part in this X-Tech search program culminating uh, here in Washington, D.C. Um, so today I'm going to take you through a little bit about who Project OWL is, what we build, uh, our customers we set out to serve, and, and what the future looks like for our company. Project OWL is an adaptable and cost-effective network solution. And this solution is highly customizable to communications and sensing networks. And we do this through an interplay of hardware and software. The hardware is made from a wireless device called the DuckLink, which you'll see in a moment, as well as a software platform, the OWL Data Management System, which enables networks from austere rural environments to dense urban or subterranean locations on the ground, water, or in the air. On the left, you'll see a photo of our deployable ubiquitous connectivity kit, or a duck. We've got several of them sitting up here on a table. We've been very fortunate over the last year or so to partner with elite institutions like Columbia University and Cal Poly. We've won awards from the National Security Innovation Network, Lockheed Martin, and IBM. And we've been very fortunate that our mission has been picked up and amplified by media organizations around the world. Most recently, we were on Good Morning America last month for our work on resilient, deployable networks following natural disasters. Networks are one of the six identified Army modernization priorities. And while we have a lot of options for current networking capabilities, they, they tend to be very expensive. A, a lot of times they tend to be very complicated, and many times as well they tend to be fragile. And this is especially true not just in defense-focused markets, but consumer and civilian markets as well. A hurricane just a couple days ago ripped through southeastern United States, knocked out power and communications across an enormous population of human beings. And we've continued to hear this problem across a lot of demonstrations, testing, and conversations we've had uh, across the greater DOD, even beyond the Army, through USASOC components, JSOC, M SMUs, MARSOC, and others. And in specific scenarios, we, we've seen this problem that uh, takes several different forms, that information and communications networks, they, they often don't interoperate with one another effectively on the ground, on drones or aircraft or other vehicles and on traditional infrastructure. And this came out of conversations with the 112th Signals Battalion and our um, STTR Phase II sponsor, the Air Force 24th Special Operations Wing. 
We found that secure tactical Monet networks, while they tend to be powerful and in some scenarios capable, they're, they're tough to integrate into kits and they're quite burdensome. You know, if you used one as a physical weapon, you could really hurt someone with some of these radios. They're quite large. And oftentimes, they're also very expensive, which makes it really stressful to not lose them. And this came out of conversations, testing, and prototype deliverables to Task Force Green, the Rangers, and 5th SFG USASOC. And last, we've seen that C4 ISR networks need sophisticated constellation networks to effectively leverage sensor information. And specifically, hazmat sensors on top of that can be very complicated to integrate. They can be very expensive to integrate to traditional radios. And this uh, challenge was identified in a previous judging round of X-Tech search. An Army CD R&D officer who was a judge reached out to tell us that she had been looking for a solution like Project Owl for years. This C4 ISR solution is highly adaptable to a variety of networking, communications, and sensing needs through the DuckLink device. This device is lower profile and more customizable than competing hardware and yet more cost competitive than its peers. The ducks run our open source firmware, enabling it to automatically sync into network clusters with other ducks deployed in an area. Integrated sensor data, ATAC information, PNT sensor data or communications, they'll permeate these networks when they're deployed. And that can either be managed locally in a device, I'll show you up front in a moment, or that data can flow up through a network gateway into our cloud OWL data management software where it can be managed by enterprise, officials, commanders, or that data can be forwarded through APIs to external systems and databases as well. Our technology is designed to be integrative, not to replace technology stacks. So we've designed this to integrate with ATAC, to integrate with MPU-5s and Silvus radios and already pre-deployed technologies and not require complete replacements of technology stacks. The end result is a solution that's an order of magnitude more cost competitive than its peers in the market and can still empower communications, interoperable data systems, and unified signals intelligence. C4 ISR lays the foundation of every mission in the modern Army. Army units such as the 112 Signals Battalion need interoperable data and intelligence systems to coordinate between tactical units and command. Operators in Task Force Green and the Rangers require secure, trusted communications to execute their mission sets. And CBRND officers often rely on advanced signals intelligence to inform effective decision making and to keep their peers safe. And maybe even these examples I've showed you and ones you'll see in the future can empower concepts of your own design, how to leverage these customizable, de customizable devices for needs in your own environment. This adaptable foundation for data networks can leverage variable power sources like solar panels and larger batteries. We can leverage autonomous deployment platforms like drones. We can include um, self-management tablets to monitor networks on the go without touching the cloud in an isolated network. The flexibility of this solution even inspired one operator who was testing to say that if we continue developing this, it could fundamentally change the nature of special warfare tactics in America. Project OWL is a unique interplay of simple, durable hardware and a customizable open source firmware, the ClusterDuck protocol, that we released alongside the Linux Foundation in March of 2020. Since then, in just over 12 months, we've grown that community from five to over 700 individuals across 20 time zones developing security, network algorithms, and other types of uh, unique IoT capabilities for this Linux operating of sorts for small wireless electronics. The fundamental flexibility of this technology allows it to apply to several large multi-billion dollar commercial markets as well. We can build industrial and energy sensor networks, something we're exploring heavily one of the advisors to our company, Wayne Beecroft, is a vice president of British Petroleum, and we're looking at a much more cost-effective, easy-to-use, and larger-scale methane sensing technology that you can apply from 
rural oil fields in Wyoming to deep offshore oil rigs in the Gulf. You can apply these ducts that have GPSs embedded and other types of climate and temperature sensors to logistics and fleet management networks, like on a crate of tomatoes coming from a farm in Mexico to a um, market in Germany, able to track its location, its time, and relay that data effectively over any channels available to it. And to date, our largest base of deployment of our duck links are permanent solar powered devices, several dozen of them in Puerto Rico, supporting uh, disaster resilience communications networks in a location that often gets devastated by natural disasters. Project OWL has seen an accelerating interest from the US Department of Defense in the last 12 months. In this time frame, we've closed four SBIR and STTR contracts and last month concluded an STTR phase two. We were working in conjunction with Columbia University sponsored by Air Force 724 STG. We've closed 1.15 million in total funding since our founding just over two years ago. 50% of that total has come just in the last few months and in 2020 we grew revenue 4.8x year over year. Funding to date has come 43% commercially and 57% from the defense sector reinforcing our dual use application and company. Founded commercially, we won the IBM Call for Code, a global technology competition that asked developers to come up with solutions that can help communities prepare for, deal with, and recover from natural disasters. We were selected amongst a competition, uh, a, a cohort of competition of over 100,000 competitors with judges that included former President Bill Clinton. Most recently, we're currently executing on a World Bank funded contract to deploy resilient solar powered communications to Himachal Pradesh in northern India. As our technology also evolves, we were named Open Source Project of the Week by IT Ops Times earlier this year. And again, along this journey, we've been very fortunate that our mission has been amplified by media organizations uh, domestically and abroad. Over the last few months, uh, you know, we started as a commercial company and very few folks, and I, I say that liberally in our company, have had any defense background prior to this journey. X Tech Search has been an exceptional um, experience for us and education to be able to better understand the needs of the US Department of Defense and to be able to apply our technology effectively to those challenges. Project OWL is developed and is executing on a transition strategy that encourages continued expansion, customer development, and product evolution. And we think about this transition strategy in five core elements, and that's our target customers and end users, the facilitators who help put us in the hands of those end users, our partnerships and advisory that teaches us the things we need to know to be effective in this market, Credibility, lending organizations and events, and delivery, how we finally deliver that solution to make an impact. These customer targets we've de developed in just the last few months, many of which we've been fortunate to meet through the X-Tech Search program, have included Army, F Army 5th SFG USASOC, Army Rangers, Task Force Green, CBRND, and notably the overarching entity we're targeting for acquisition is soldier. Facilitators who have helped put us into the hands of these end users, testers, uh, and potential customers include this X-Tech Search program, first and foremost, the Army Sensors Directorate, the National Security Innovation Network, Softworks, Devcom ARL, um, who even just yesterday when we were touring the facility, uh, our CTO had a phenomenal conversation with Andrew Toth of their Networking and Information Sciences Department. Um, a new relationship that feels like it may really grow into something substantial, as well as AFWorks, who's funded several of our SBIR and STTR efforts to date. We've developed several quite impactful partnerships and advisory organizations that have helped us educate to become a, uh, a very capable defense-focused organization, which include Columbia University, Cal Poly University, Decisive Point and Ensign, who we just uh, engaged and were accepted into their Propel program. Larkin Industries, who's helped develop many of our relationships at Fort Bragg and with the Special Operations Community in Tampa. 
as well as Lockheed Martin, who we have an ongoing conversation with uh, for a potential subcontract, as well as their ventures program, which spawned out of this X-Tech search competition as well. And every single one of those photos you see below is a prototype and demo kit that was sent to one of these customer end mm -hmm. targets uh, to help better engage and, and um, figure out if we can satisfy their challenges in networking. We've targeted many events, as many as we can, especially given the pandemic, to lend credibility to our efforts in defense-focused markets. And this includes testing and prototypes that we've sent to Task Force Green, the Rangers, 5th SFG, USASOC. We completed Georgia Tech and the Department of Defense's Thunderstorm event in New York City, where we deployed a mesh network of our Ducklink devices five floors underneath the, the New World Trade Center in the maintenance shafts. We competed, or I should say, participated in Verizon Operation Convergent Response, and we showcased a mesh network we deployed via drone that floated on water of our Ducklink devices. After all, where would a, what would a duck be if it couldn't float on water? We participated in DHS Shake and Fury in Birmingham, Alabama, where we showcased hazardous gas sensors. Uh, we anticipate competing or participating in Department of Homeland Security's Urban OpEx in New York City in 2022 as well. We're looking at SOCOM technical experimentation uh, 22.1 as well as Coastal Trident showcasing mesh networks deployed on ships. And we're very excited about all of them. And then finally, all of these partnerships, customers, facilitators, and credibility lending events give us the ability to deliver this final solution transition our capability to the U.S. Army. And we do that by gathering that feedback from those target customers I mentioned, leveraging the SBIR and STTR program to develop the necessary R&D. All of these prototypes we sent out consistently identified we needed three things to be able to deliver a product. Encryption, security and isolation protocols, and hybrid networking backhauls, the ability to leverage SATCOM and cellular. Concluding that STTR a month ago, we delivered all of them to these customers. We're allow we use these then deliveries to expand from beyond our technical persons of contact and the units we prototype to to gather other interests and identify other places where the solution can be leveraged. And we're also uh, uh, utilizing our advisory and partnership institutions, particularly in the academic community to help us meet certain regulations and certifications as necessary. And those photos on the right are the deployable ubiquitous connectivity kits that were shipped to Air Force 724th STG. That box on the right, which I will show you, is a hybrid network backhaul that has SATCOM, cellular, and Wi-Fi capabilities all inside one. We're very excited about upcoming execution on the horizon. We've already demonstrated to several USASOC components most recently Army Rangers via Softworks Text Tuesday, as well as others, and we're looking forward to continuing that uh, uh, in the near future. Over the next 12 to 18 months, we expect to develop commercial pilot opportunities with energy logistics and community resilience, as well as continuing to engage the SBIR, STTR program. Wayne Beecroft, an advisor, said at one point that this cost-effective real-time surveillance technology provides us the ability to monitor and react quickly to improve business margins and reduce health, safety, and environmental incidents anywhere in the world. Our team is made up of passionate individuals with experience building hardware, software, and analytics tools, and we're inspired to develop game-changing technology for the United States Army. So I'm gonna move into a brief demo up front and just show you guys kind of how these work. We're good. So I have a deployable ubiquitous connectivity kit here. Inside you have some duck links, small, lightweight, easy to use, soldier proof. There's one button, on or off. You notice you get a nice bright yellow light, yellow like a rubber duck, identifying that as on. To configure any of these duck links, you can connect to them wirelessly over Bluetooth, over Wi-Fi. And um, when you do connect to these, they'll provide you a portal that pops up on your phone. You know how if you've gone to a Starbucks and you try to join the Wi-Fi, a portal pops up asking you to agree to terms and conditions? 
We leverage that, but instead of asking you to join our terms, that's where you can access a duck, configure it, set up encryption or decryption methods, things like that. This is the hybrid backhaul. This is an unfunctional variant. We shipped all of our working ones, but to give you a sense of size, this has SATCOM cellular and Wi-Fi backhaul capabilities. This device uh, we would retail for just about $1,000. And in here, we have a device, a tablet computer that we use to manage local networks, um, running the OWL DMS locally, being able to be isolated from the World Wide Web. And in conclusion, I, I'm super excited about the future. In May, uh, under an STTR in partnership with Cal Poly, we put Space Duck 2 up to 100,000 feet on an atmospheric balloon. Like all of our other ducks in shapes and sizes, a duck is a duck is a duck. It runs our open source firmware. It runs our 915 megahertz LoRa band. It can do all the sensing and integration. And it's cheaper than any other CubeSat that's been put into space. We've got a phenomenal uh, uh, product development roadmap ahead of us, including ducks that are even smaller and more cost effective that can still leverage this radio protocol. We're developing our own electronics to lift off our reliance on Chinese and Asian components that will be just as cost effective, but far more resilient, secure, and of a higher quality that we can manufacture just down the street from us in the United States. I'm very inspired about our company's future roadmap. I'm inspired about our manufacturing ability stateside, and I'm inspired to continue building a solution that can make a positive impact in the United States Army. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you all for your time. So we have about eight minutes, so I'll let the judges kind of take it away. I'm kind of dumb in this area, so I'll ask a dumb question. They're, they're all dumb for me. Uh, what it boils down to is, so uh, I didn't get a good idea in the demo, so I can uh, basically hook up through this without cell phone activity, have two different phones through your network and get full streaming FaceTime or HD, or what am I looking at, small data packets? Or small data, data, low bandwidth, 915 megahertz LoRa. You can deploy okay. mesh networks with these. Got it, right on it, yep. thank you. So basic communication, sensors, GPS data, things like that. I saw on your um, some of the earlier material. The company is five employees. Is that is that dated or is it still just five? Uh, employees? Close. I'd say seven now, but we're probably one of the smaller, younger companies in this competition. Yes. All right. Well, it seems like you've done remarkable work for that. Um, I also saw in there that I think you had partnered with uh, was it two or three Puerto Rican universities? Yes, correct. Um, I, I think Hurricane Maria might have predated your product, but you did mention disaster relief. Do you know if it was used at all during uh, the Hurricane Maria recovery efforts? Hurricane Maria did predate our efforts. It's a, in fact, in many ways, it facilitated the founding of this company. Uh, the uh, inaugural call for code came on the heels of four major Atlantic hurricanes, Maria, Irma, Harvey in Texas, and Florence in the Carolinas. Those four happened in a 12-month time period caused over 10,000 casualties and inflicted over $300 billion in damage. The result of that was the competition and our efforts to develop a better way to bring back communications. A year and a half later after Maria, we were in Puerto Rico and there are still parts of the island that didn't have comms online of any type. And that's why we developed this and that's why we've developed, uh, deployed three dozen solar powered devices to Puerto Rico. In fact, in January 2020, earthquakes took a lot of internet offline and power offline. Uh, our devices continued operating in a local capacity, but we couldn't see them from New York City. This facilitated a new device we had developed, what predated that hybrid backhaul. We called it the Dish Duck. It was our first duck that could communicate over Iridium SATCOM, powered by the sun. So without power, without internet, you could still communicate around the world. So another fair description is a hyper-localized network. Gives me the ability to connect, like let's say, a distributed squad of soldiers. Yeah, and you can choose, do you want to have this backhaul to the internet or do you want it to be completely isolated? That's right. up to you. And so which one, there's, there's a central one that connects to the internet? Yeah, there will be typically in any mesh one or several gateways 
that's up to you as well. Is there, what's the, uh, is, is there a bandwidth limitation, right? Is there a power to this, right? Uh, a lot of things that we're, folks are going after are localized clouds, right? So how big is this localized cloud? So it's, it's not high bandwidth. So typically we get asked about like a, an MPU5, very powerful radio system, quite expensive. If you want to stream HD video 20 miles from one mountaintop to another, that's your product. In many cases, though, you need to leverage sensing, not such a huge environment, basic communication, sharing ATAC data or GeoChat. That's where these can not only provide a great solution, but they can integrate with an MPU-5. So if your tactical squad has a couple MPU-5s, you could think, you know, we could take five MPU-5s out with us, 10 to 20 grand a radio, or we could take three MPU-5s out and take 100 ducks with us to complement and connect into those radio networks. And that's kind of where we see our capability is, no, you can't stream Netflix yet. It's not a super high bandwidth solution, but it can do a lot of things that maybe you don't need that Ferrari of a system for just yet. So um, from a uh, tactical waveform perspective, LPI, LPD, things along those lines, um, how visible is your network to our enemies? And can you characterize that for us? Mm -hmm. So one of these uh, security and isolation protocols we implemented was the ability to hop around frequencies. One way to execute on LPI, LPD, uh, each of these ducts transmits at 100 milliwatts, so it's relatively low power. And we're very interested in exploring some of the electronics we've been looking at, our software-defined radios moving into the future, which gives us a lot more control over the type of radio we take out in the field without having to change the hardware. And so our interest moving forward is giving a soldier the ability to say, I want this radio at this frequency on this power at some time in the future. Or the ability to say to the device, you need to go dark now and turn off all your EM footprint. So that's something we can do now. But while we're tied to the 915 megahertz band, based on our electronics moving forward, we want to continue to imbue uh, one of those core value props, our customizability into our hardware devices. So as you look at putting uh, mesh together, how, how far does the scale, how many, is, is there a limit to how many nodes you can put together? And then, you know, you showed the device on my left. Um, does that manage all nodes in the network or do, are there multiples of those? How, how would you envision implementation mm -hmm. or is it variable? Um, so we've done, to your first question, we've done networks of at least 60 nodes. I'm confident it could go quite larger. The real limitation is data throughput. What kind of data are you pumping through the network? And, you know, if it's, say, so this device has a smoke sensor on the front. I think a hazardous gas sensor. I think this particular one's air quality. It could be methane, benzene, something else more esoteric. This one has an infrared motion sensor on the front. So you think, turn this guy on, put some double stick tape, just like slap him on a tree somewhere or something. If you got a lot of these passive sensors out in the field, this is a temperature pressure one. Um, we can also do acoustic sensors, vibration. If you can name a sensor, there's a pretty good chance we can integrate it. If you put a bunch of these out in the field, I'm confident you'd go way past 60 because it's not as much data. So the United States Army has used something like this before. It's called RIMBAS and RIMBAS 2. I'd highly recommend you look at that if you haven't already. The other piece is what kind of battery consumption and battery life, if you put this out in the field, is it going to consume? Based on usage, if you're using for comms, typically a day anywhere from 6 to 24 hours for comms. If you're using it strictly for sensors in the LoRa radio, that battery life gets greatly extended from to days or even weeks based on how often you're transmitting and sensing. How would you, how would you charge them in the field or you, what would you do after the day? Um, plug them in. Uh, you could hot swap batteries. Um, when we were first demoing this to units in the DOD and they'd ask how much they were and we'd tell them it's $250 base for a unit, they'd say, oh great, they're disposable. Which to me was a bit of a shock because I was like, well, I wouldn't throw one away. But um, 
so even to that extent, you know, these are made with a biodegradable corn-based plastic. So if you wanted to toss one in the field or you lose it or it gets destroyed, no big deal, just grab another. You mentioned um, the hardware is open source. Does that open you to any zero day problems or any other security issues? Can I answer this briefly? Um, real quick. Up to we run out of time. You would think yes. However, the visibility it has to so many eyes around the world actually over time makes it more secure. Linux is a great example of this if you want to see how it's done at scale. All right. Thank you, Project Thank you so Owl. Much. So our next pitch will start in a few minutes at 1.40.